Um, <clears throat> again, for those of you who have not been to, uh, to a startup grind event, it really is just a conversation between a couple people for about 45 minutes-ish, and then we'll open up for Q&A at the end, so feel free to ask questions uh, towards the end of the uh, thing, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, whatever you, whatever you're, Mark, Mark said I'll answer anything, whatever it is, within reason. As long as, as, long as no not, comment. No, exactly, no, no comment. <laughs> great. Uh, so, so Mark, let's let's start off by just asking a, a simple thing, like because I actually had one person ask me, like, what is SmartSheet? So now you think, oh, well, everyone knows about SmartSheet, but everyone doesn't know about SmartSheet. So can you tell us, like, like tell us about the product, yeah. what it is, like the the layman terms? Yeah, so it's a software service. So our, our clients subscribe to us online. Uh, in 190 countries, so a lot, a lot of customers, paying customers in 190 countries, and they subscribe to the service to either plan, track, automate, or report on work they're doing. Okay, so what does work they're doing mean? <laughs> so work they're doing means stuff that we traditionally used in Excel or a Google Sheet to track, plan, manage, and report out on stuff. So these are lists that cover events, they cover processes, they cover customer lists, they cover issues, they cover enhancement requests. You get the point. Thousands of use cases. And what we believed is that uh, with about a billion people globally having used spreadsheets before, uh, we fully recognized in our past company that we used those spreadsheets for things well beyond financials. We use them to track work, and work is like non-numerics. Yeah. So Smartsheet handles that a lot more elegantly in the cloud than Excel or Google Sheets. Very well. You, how many times have you said that thing? A few times. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and, and tell us the kind of the journey for Smartsheet, like from the early days. You know, Rocket ship right out of the gate. Yeah, <laughs> that is a lie. We know that's a lie. <laughs> not, not true. Not true. Uh, so tell us like the first couple years. I mean, I, I know Brent, it's, you know, he started Onyx and you work with him there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so kind of tell us how that formed, you know, the first early yeah. days. Like he'd come and he's like, hey, I got this idea. You should, you should help, right? Yeah. Well, there were four, there were four co-founders. Yeah. So Brent and three other people, John yeah. Creason, Maria Colacurcio, and Eric Brown. And each of them uh, shared a belief that this was a market opportunity because at our prior company, Onyx, three out of the four co-founders, we had observed after deploying heavier systems, you'd go in and you'd audit and say, hey, to what degree is Onyx being used? And they liked it. And they're like, well, what you, what's all that other work you're doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're using Excel. Interesting. Sure. Uh, and I think there was that strong belief of that there's a better way to do that. And it really um, captured someone's willingness to use software that is complex to get something done. Yeah. And there wasn't a great willingness or tolerance for that. Um, so it's it's that capitalizing on what people already understood and then marrying that to newer concepts. Yeah. Um, so when it, when it first started, it's a few people with an idea. And, and well beyond the idea, it also needs to be what's the circumstance in those people's lives. Are they married? Do they have kids? Do they have the capital to like yeah. not make money for a while? I mean, all those factors come in. And it happened to be sort of that perfect... Perfect storm sounds bad, but perfect marriage of circumstances yeah. that created Smartsheet. And after I had left Onyx, our previous company, after ten and a half years there, I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm going to take three months off. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> we're going to go. I don't know what we're going to do. It was going to be awesome. <laughs> and then like two and a half weeks later, like, hey, I got this. This is a pretty cool opportunity. <laughs> and it, it all went down at a diner in Bellevue. Diner in Bellevue. Diner in Bellevue. Uh, where Brent and I had breakfast, and um, the the four people who founded Smartsheet, none of them, Brent included, wanted to run the damn thing. <laughs> like, uh, we don't want <laughs> we have a great idea. Would you like to do it? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so they, uh, Brent was actually not uh, operationally involved early. Yeah. Uh, he was he was um, one of the investors. Uh, so we came in, and there were six people, and you know, pre revenue, and I was, and <laughs> when you when you think of the mortality rate. On startups, so I joined two pre-revenue. Like after my two-year stint after Dartmouth, yeah, you, you I went into you're two pre-revenue. So lucky. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> two. Right, so that's how I got started. Yeah. So, so like that is a good point. Like thinking about like the the odds to be in two startups that have done so well. Like 
out the gate. Like, like you've got this, like, what is it? The, uh, you know, are you the, the golden child? <laughs> You're like, get him on our team because just good things happen. Well, like four and a half years <laughs> in, our spouses were like, wasn't this supposed to like be a lot more awesome sooner? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did this presentation at uh, UW Bothell, and it was an entrepreneur class. And we had this, I had this beautiful chart which showed our growth from 2010, 11, 12, 13, I think it was 2014. I mean, it was like up and to the right. Yeah. And they're like, let's start a company. This is incredible. It's so easy. And then I hit the build, and it showed like 2009, 8, 7, 6. It's just like a lot less sexy. Like a lot less sexy. Like flatline sexy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, so I said, that's sort of where you get tested. Yes. And so we've, we've experienced both. And at Onyx, we experienced the dot-com bubble when we were 80% exposed to tech. We had 950 employees and 130 million revenue, and we got ratcheted down to about 67 million in revenue with half the team members real quickly. How, how quick was that? Like, how quick did it go? Pretty quickly. Yeah. It was like honeymoon. I remember seeing NASDAQ explode. No, honey, I think this is bad. <laughs> We're very exposed to tech. Yes. Um, but, you know, we persevered, and sure. that company and asset is still out there. We still have customers on that platform. Um, so, yeah. And, and for you, for Mark, <clears throat> what is the, uh, you know, looking back at the early days of, of Onyx and then the early days of Smartsheet, is there a couple things that you can, like, maybe put together, like, very similar and that you enjoyed? Not the bad ones, but the good ones. What are yeah. the good things that maybe correlated a bit, or maybe there wasn't any? No, there were. There were. I think it's I, the reason I hesitate is because it's it's so easy to look back and then like make up a story, like here's revisionist history, and this is. <laughs> so I, I'm really trying to be honest, honest. in that answer. Yeah. Um, there were some really neat people, uh, and that's it's like well he's of course great people. No, it's it's there was a diversity in thought there, so it wasn't a cookie cutter group. So with with Smartsheet, it was not just. Oh, some people from Onyx, but it was John Creason coming in who came in from uh, Concur. Someone I didn't know, different perspective, had done SaaS before, and that was really neat. So John was a great teacher to me early, um, and someone from whom I just learned a ton about how to go to marketing SaaS yeah. and how to build a SaaS product. So I think when you, when you think of those learnings, I think anybody who tells you, like, I was so awesome and I had the most amazing ideas, like, mm, it's typically a team. And if you surround yourself with people from whom you can learn and sort of create this really tight bond, that's that's sort of what that's what makes that's what enables you to make it through the really tough years. Yeah, the ones where you go from 130 to 67. Yeah, or why aren't we sell, why can't we sell this product or what do we need to change? Those are some very frustrating moments. Yeah. And if you don't have a good backstop with your team, then then I think the mortality rate on businesses very often is high because the team just says, well, I guess we're done. Hit the eject button. Yeah. Yeah, which is not probably the best thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And and where is the, you know, uh, if you're not, let's say you're not going to start a company, you know, next year. Like, we, we sit down and say, you know, we're going to start this thing. We like this thing. Um, what would be, like, what would be the things that Mark would want to do? Like, not knowing anything, just saying, here's the things I would like to do. Like, category-wise yeah. or what we want to like achieve? operational things. Like, what, what things would you like to physically be doing in the in the job of creating that company? Like, where does Mark fit in as the, your skills are best at these things and these are the things I would want to do? Like, would it's say, just a perfect thing. You, it's a perfect world, right? I would say market fit and first dollar. Oh, okay. So market dollar. fit, first dollar. That's great. So first be, dollar. First dollar, because it's like you can get, so you find yourself in this echo chamber of, Mike, you're so awesome. No, no, you're so awesome. No, no, man, your idea is better. I don't know. Yours is pretty good. It's like, would you just shut up? It's like, is a customer actually going to feel the same way? Are they going to give you that first dollar? And what you hear so often is, you have, well, so many people are using our stuff. So many people are told us it's incredible. It's like, okay, what's the economic element of that? <laughs> yeah. So that's where I think I have a lot of passion and therefore... Um, I think can bring skills to the table. Yeah, so the first dollar, that's that's great. Because that is, in my opinion, what I take it for what it's worth, is some of the hardest things to teach someone if they've never done it. It's like getting the yes to the first dollar. It's not just, oh, yeah, like you tell your friends, oh, and they're like, oh, what a great product, we love your product. But actually having someone write you a check, mm -hmm. the first check, and figure, that is, the to me, the one of the hardest parts to get people over the mm -hmm. hump. Yeah, because once you have the first dollar, and you're like, 
unless that was completely out of the blue, we should be able to get another dollar. And maybe how do we tell a better story to get two dollars, ten, a thousand, ten thousand? Yeah. And that that increasing of the watermark, I also find very exciting. Um, you know, looking back at when we, you know, our average sales price in the early days was a few hundred bucks a year. And we're like, oh my God, we got a fifteen hundred dollar a year deal, man. We are killing it, <laughs> and it was so. And, it, and looking back, it was really exciting. But it's also that that pushing yourself to um, expect more, and yeah. and making and, and going for that next high water, that high water mark, which then becomes the new normal, which lets you. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like go that first, first first person to run the four hundred mile, right? Yeah. Like, right. oh shit, we can yeah. run the four hundred mile. Yeah. yeah. Scoot up so your head is not in the light the way it is. So when the camera don't have us. There, there we go. go. Um, so. When when you um, you know again you're talking about those early days, what were some of the tough things that you guys went through that um, that now looking back on it's like you know that was hard but this is what we got out of it like tell us a couple stories in there or one story that you you know were pretty not necessarily proud but like just happy that the group made it through it like there was some pretty big things and I'm talking about smart sheet not not honestly. yeah uh, I mean. <laughs> so I, I, it triggers a funny memory for me because one of the things that I remember, we had a really warm office. Like you mean temperature? Physically, like we were in a we were in a house. Um, someone asked me the other day, like, do you miss the early days? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It was super warm. So we were in this little house in Kirkland, uh, residential, zoned residential. Sure. Mm. Why were you there? I mean, I have to ask the question. Why were you there? Why were you in a house? Uh, there was no revenue, and it was offices house? are somewhat expensive. It was somebody's house? Yeah, we rented a house. Oh, okay. okay. That was the okay. office. There you go. Okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Before first dollar, you better be frugal. <laughs> That's right. So, um, no, so I think the uh, some of the some of the memories from early on, um, and some of the sort of the key lessons were um, when you you can over plan and over structure your company too early. So today I was talking to our entire product and uh, product management and engineering lead group, and I was telling stories about how I was a QS, QA tester for the company. Right, and I was a videographer for the company, and I was a, so you can spend a lot of time saying, "Hey, we need to hire a director of video. We need to hire." So the early days, some of those memories was the team coming together and doing what was necessary to do the minimum required to build a product, ship a product, and and not having any. I mean, there was no like nobody was disgruntled. Nobody was like, "Oh, really? Why can't we hire QA?" No, it's like do it, do the job. Yeah, yeah. Just and um, and some of those things from the early days, that attitude. Um, is super important, I think, to maintain because there will always be that next thing that you either don't have enough funds to do, or it isn't proven out enough, or somebody needs to step up. Yeah, yeah. And that's what that's what I really remember from those from those early days. Yeah, that's, that's always the the funnest are always when you uh, when you know this, you know everything has to be done. Mm -hmm. and there's three three guys to mm -hmm. do it. Well, I, one one other thing I said today was I said it's been a an interesting. So I'm 47 now, and you would think that I would have learned this lesson a long time ago. Uh, but I said to the team, I said when you realize that to achieve really great things, you're going to have to work really really hard. You spend almost no time looking for the easy door. And I think a lot of times entrepreneurs they'll like allocate 15 to 20 percent. I think there's that easy thing. Let's uh, if I only had the formula, it's like it's actually not there. It doesn't exist. It may, I mean, but the odds are so low that you find the easy door that you better buckle down and do it. Yeah. And I think if you have that mentality, you you tend to gripe less about those difficult circumstances. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Where, where is um, um, you know, where do you see? Uh, let's let's take a step. If you were sitting in this chair four years ago, okay, okay since so two thousand thirteen. Yep. Would you have predicted where you are today? Yeah. Really? Absolutely, because that was we were already past in two thousand thirteen. We had already. Um, cleared a couple of really important hurdles. Yeah. So 2013, depends if it's like beginning of 13 or end of 13. End of 13, we were probably 20 million in revenue already. Had a pretty good sense that we were onto something. Yeah. And we'd seen some evidence of people laddering up in subscription. We'd seen some of that move. Uh, five years ago, probably not. Couldn't have seen it. No. And why? I mean, because it's it's a it's a probability thing. Right? I mean, all of us said, of course we're going to do that, but it's it's a what are the odds you would put yeah, on that? Yeah, exactly. 50-50, 20-80, 80-20. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, and we we went through some difficult periods there. So I mean, everyone was betting on on themselves, but again, if you put hard dollars down, say, okay, what are the real odds? The mortality rate. Most companies don't yeah, don't, make, don't make those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't make it at all. And, and where where do you why do you think companies don't make those those like milestones like like getting from six seven million to ten twelve million is a big step, and getting from ten twelve to twenty is it? Mm -hmm. Those are two pretty large steps because, like you say, once you get to eighteen twenty sixteen million dollars, you're like, okay, we got some things figured out here. We're doing a million dollars a month, right? So, what, what do you think the things are that maybe hinder or the speed bumps for entrepreneurs to get over that hump? Well, I think it's a really delicate composite. And when I think back at the team, when the team was 30 or 40 people, 45 people, there were a couple parts of the business which were single-threaded. Yeah. And if that one part of the composite, for some reason, person gets sick, person needs to uh, take care of a family member, I mean, the, the model can break. Yeah. So when you're single-threaded, um, you deal with it, right, because you don't have the funds to, to, to ladder up. Uh, and I think that's where some of the sort of good fortune and luck comes in. It's less about, hey, the big deal showed up. It's more about the team was able to stick yeah. and make it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the first thing I think of. And do, do you think, uh, you know, everyone says, as you already kind of stated, it's like, yeah, the team's everything. But um, how more important is the team when you are at 15 people than when the, you're at 150 people? You no difference. Uh, very different, but no difference in terms of importance. Sure. Because we don't. We don't get graded on like what we just did. Oh, yeah. With our investors, they, yeah, they care that we had a good last quarter. It's all about next year. Yeah. So it is as I mean, and I would say that the number of people and the number, the types of skills we need today are as scarce as they were back then. A little different complexion, but super scarce. Sure, still hard to find. Still super hard to find. Yeah. And how do you, how do you do that? How do you? Well, like, do you have any tricks for finding good people? I mean, you're all, we're, we're all, like, everybody I talk to in this stage has a problem finding people. It's not like, yeah. oh, really, Mark? You're the first guy. But like, how, do you do anything different than you guys? That Yeah, I would say one of the biggest, uh, I don't have a bunch of regrets, but one of the things that I did too late at Smartsheet was um, install a true recruiting team. Like, high competency, high effectiveness recruiting team sure. and, and, there's, and it's a real big difference between having a line in the water and actually fishing like really fishing yeah, yeah, yeah. targeting changing the lures I mean these are it's a pain in the ass <laughs> it's much harder than just like hanging out and like, hey I guess we didn't get anything today Mike yeah. no like fish <laughs> work fish. work and um, and that's one thing where you have to so when we do um, a meetup my ass is at the meetup I'm talking to them about our values. I'm talking to them about, I'm not like, hey, can you please go out there and Tell parrot what I told you like a year ago? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get out there. And people people have, um, most people have a pretty uh, good radar for whether someone is feeding them a line or actually they mean it, yeah. whether they mean it. And every time you're at bat, you have to deliver it. Yeah. Every time. Because we had a meetup at Daniel's the other night. We probably had... 100 engineering candidates, and my attitude is, so you could say, Mark, what was the median candidate like at that event? I might say, not someone we would hire. And I'm totally oh. fine with that, because if we get three people out of 100, we're batting a really poor percentage, but those three people are probably amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I get excited about stuff like that. Yeah. Some people say, oh, that's not a good return. It's, yeah. like, it's a great return. I got three good people. Great return. Yeah. I just spent one night and I got three good people. And I think that, I think when you, um, so I start every new employer orientation off with a statement around values not mattering. And they're like, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> values values matter. matter a ton. But values, as just adjectives written on our web careers page, they don't mean anything. So my big deal is you better exercise your values every day. So. You better be observant, head on a swivel, or are you having a hard time, can I do something about it? Is customer having a hard time? Is a salesperson needing better support? And if you're observant, you're going to hopefully have an idea on how you can fix the situation. And most people, I would argue, stop there. And they go, man, Mike, I am so damn smart. 
I observed that you have a big issue, and I had this idea how I could fix it. <laughs> and you're like, uh, you still haven't done anything for me yet. Exactly. You haven't helped, actually. You've, you've patted yourself on the back. Yeah. So for me, the next three layers are, do you research, like check down, are other people seeing this? And this whole ad, the old adage of best idea wins, I don't subscribe to at all. I think it's the best idea that is most effectively presented and recommended wins. So if you can, if you're observant and curious and you ideate well and you check down and research and then you recommend really well, then you have a chance to execute. Yeah. But it's like the whole like, I'm super innovative, I'm super driven, I'm so supportive. It's like it's really lost on me. Yeah, yeah. So I have a lot of heat around this because <laughs> I think like I think high I think high potential teams uh, are only high potential teams until they run that stack. Yeah, yeah. Then that becomes low potential extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And where where is the uh, you know when you're when you're finding uh, you know these the, the new people. Um, do you interview? I mean, you got interview, right? You still yeah, interview, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't so, interview most people anymore, no, but, you, but but you're in the cycle somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, what are some questions that you you think are are great questions, and why do you think they're great questions? And the because you're still you're still trying to find this person if they're a good culture fit. I'm assuming that's a big deal to you. Maybe it, I'm saying it, wrong. It is a big deal, but it doesn't trump. Um, Again, it's, I'm back to the word composite, right? It's you, someone who's a great culture fit, but doesn't clear the skills hurdle, sure. is a friend. <laughs> sure. right? They may not be a, a colleague. Yeah. Um, so the culture, the way we refer to it internally is, um, we refer to it as the Spokane test, which is actually a term that I heard from another startup, actually growth stage company, uh, Eagle View years ago. There's, I heard their CEO talk about it at me. I'm like, I'm like, after that, what's the Spokane test? The Spokane test is when we, we go down the checklist of quality, skills, all the, all the, 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 the hard stuff. And then we say, could we get in a car and drive to Spokane with that person without throwing their behind out the door? Interesting. <laughs> like if you if you're if your mile marker's seventy, you're like, oh, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> great skills, but annoying me <laughs> out of me. Yes. Probably not a great person. Probably yeah. not a great candidate. So, so we uh, we apply that test at the end, but you have to clear the competency hurdle. Sure. Um, Spokane yeah. test. Spokane test. That's and good. it's and how do you ask questions around the Spokane test? It's not always questions. It's um, so if I go to a meal with someone, I look at how they treat the server. Sure. I look at whether they look at me when they shake my hand. I look at. I mean, it's, it's a lot of those are intangibles. And then it's, um, do you care? Like, do you care if you say if you only talk about shop, and you don't talk about your family situation or like what your interests are outside of work? It's like, hmm. So when we're at the office really late one night, what are you going to be like to hang out with, yeah. right? And it's and I think that's where the glue comes in. But right? if you're not interested in those other aspects, um, you may be an amazing contributor, but I, I'm not going to feel a real depth of relationship there. Yeah. Um, Which means if that means you invest a ton in somebody, and then they, yeah, I guess I'm I guess I'm out. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's not the kind of person you want. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. But we're not you're not perfect, right? So. You're not? We are not perfect. No, we are not far from it. So we make mistakes, and then what you have to do is um, just make sure you. Um, we had a great speaker, Kim Scott, and recently the author of uh, uh, Radical Candor, and she she had some. I mean, it was a really good talk, yeah. and she was talking about how you then intercept those people and exercise that radical candor and give clear feedback. And again, you can't save everyone. You can't assess everyone properly all the time, but you then need to move quickly. Yeah. Really quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, speed is speed is essential. And tell us, like, in your, uh, you know, in your kind of day-to-day -day world, where are the things that you are surprised that you're good at that, say, five years ago you were either crappy at or just never did? Like what are some things that you, you've discovered about your own self that's like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know and I'm going to ask yeah. another question about what you're bad at, so don't, you know, but yeah. So I would say the thing I've learned is uh, focusing on the things that I would naturally not gravitate towards. So if you say, Mark, what do you like doing? I'm like, I love product. I flip and love product. Sure. I got back from San Francisco yesterday. First thing I did was we did a push last night. I'm like, I want to see this stuff in market because I know it's going to affect boom, boom, boom. I was like all over product. Okay, so what do I, so I index super high on that. Yeah, yeah. So 
there was also something in my inbox about uh, reviewing a quote for a blah, blah, blah press I article. Right? I can already tell you. Uh, product first, <laughs> then I'll work on the quote. Yeah. So you have to be, if, if, you, if you're honest with yourself and you stack rank, what do I really want to do to what do I not? The stuff at the bottom of the list is sometimes very, very important. Sure. And I think that's what, uh, that's changed a lot for me in the last five years. Yeah. Making sure that, that stuff doesn't perpetually stay in the, the fifth position. <laughs> yeah. And Because for someone else, that's number one. Yeah, for some right? people, yeah, it's, it's, it's number one. And yeah, they have to. yeah. And and if you turn that question around, what you know, looking back five years, what are some things you're like, I'm just crappy at that? Like, what are some things you're just, that you, you, you have... You've either hired to to hide it or uh, like, yeah. So this is a this is being taped and it's going to be <laughs> digitized forever. Uh, so here's one thing I um, I try to practice. You're challenged with. So yesterday I was flying back from San Francisco. I won't mention the airline, <laughs> but the Wi-Fi didn't work. was really poor. Okay. And uh, so I practiced a little Zen and I told the flight attendant, I said, "You are doing a great job today." You're providing great service, but I'm super disappointed in your airline. <laughs> and I, I said it in a very matter mellow, matter-of-fact way. I was kind. She actually gave me a little chocolate as I left. I was like, okay, she felt good about her job. Um, so I, when I see someone in trouble or I see a situation that can be fixed, I react. Sometimes really forcefully. Yeah. And um, you need to be careful with that. And I, I think the, uh, I try to temper that uh -huh. because if you if you react in the moment, first of all, you maybe haven't processed the situation fully. Yeah, got enough and as, and as, if you have, as the com our company is 750 people now, when we were 30 people or 20 people, I saw everybody all day. Well, let's say I see you every two months, and, and you see me in that moment when I react. Yeah, it's not good. It's, well, you might not have a chance to actually recover or rebuild for three months. So that's that's sort of part of the thing that I've become much more intentional about. Yeah, just being aware that that mm -hmm. can happen, right? Yeah, and then use and just use it more judiciously. I mean, I uh, I'm hyper competitive. Um, I also try to be super empathetic. Um, and is that possible? Be really competitive and be empathetic? Totally, totally. I actually think you can totally do that. Yeah. Yep, I do. I do. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. I was going to say, because it takes a lot I'm of energy. Competitive, but when I'm in competitive mode, I'm less empathetic. You can actually do it. I, I really believe that. Um, but most people don't because it's pain in the ass. It's really, it's, <laughs> it's harder. It's yeah, harder. Yeah, it's harder. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that's uh, that's sort of one thing which uh, which I'm always thinking about. Good. Um, tell us about growing. You basically doubled this year. In, in employee count, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that, that isn't easy. So, no. Um, how does that affect just operational? How does that affect the culture? Uh, that's, that's question number one. I get uh, so I like getting surprised to the upside, like everyone else. And I met I met a new employee today, who uh, it's one of those you have that meeting, and within twenty minutes, I was like, hmm, there's no one like this person here. We're super, super fortunate to have him. And very quickly, I'll make you bet in six months, I'll say we might, I mean, he might be one of the key reasons we achieve something really great in this part of the business. So I, when I think of we will hire 400 plus people this year, um, there are, for, are you no, about? trailing, last 12 months, we will hire 400 people. And within that group of 400, there are some people that I know about who I feel that way about, and there are other people that I look at it as more opportunities to be surprised at the upside. Sure. And it sort of feels really good. Um, the part that has been difficult is as you go through those growth markers, there are some people, and, and everyone's heard this, some people who are amazing at 30 people yeah, yeah, yeah. who feel less comfortable. At 200. Um, and the most difficult part is when you have someone, I overuse sports analogies, <laughs> when you have someone who uh, was with you from maybe 60 people to 200 to then you go to 400, and you have to have that conversation, Mike, I don't think you're the starting point guard anymore. And they say, I think I am the starting point guard. It's like, mm. and we got Kevin Durant there. <laughs> exactly. and, it, it, and it's difficult. And that's the part where uh, that's been the, the largest um, sort of emotional challenge with that, that, that journey. But the cool thing is when you, when, you, when you get that revenue engine going and you have capital to spend, then you can go out and get talent. 
Yeah. And last I checked, private com companies, corporations don't have a salary cap, right? So you don't have to solve for this yeah. awkward number. You get you get to go out, and if you earn it and you have the capital, you get to go find your talent. Yeah. Or develop your talent, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, why do you use sports analogies a lot? Did you, I play, think did you play sports? I did play sports. I... Um, yeah, I just I just associate. I think sometimes they're 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 super they're super uh, well fitted for for a situation. I played football and crew, and I wrestled and I played basketball. So I've done a lot of different things. I've done some individual sports, some team sports, and I think I have a full appreciation for because I wasn't just an individual sport athlete. Um, I have a full appreciation for the team. Did you hire that? I've talked to many many CEOs that hire that literally ask questions about being on team sports. And use that as a filter. Yeah. Does that? Does no, it's not a big part of my. Not important. Mm -mm. Mm. Um, where, where, um, in this growth, of, you know, basically doubling your company in the in the, in the year, um, January one, did you expect it? Did you did you look say, hey, we're gonna have to hire four hundred people this year? Yeah. So you already knew that. We did. So you plan accordingly. We did. Um, and, and and what? But what we did in our plan, you. You have these quarterly checkpoints, whatever your whatever your cadence is, and heading into the tail end of the year, we actually ticked it up by ninety. Wow. Yeah. So so that's one where, and it's not, and the interesting thing on on the growth is you don't get an immediate benefit, right? So if you say, what are we solving for in calendar year two thousand seventeen, you actually can't ask that question. That's the wrong question to ask because as a north of a hundred million dollar recurring business growing north of fifty percent a year, you need to solve for two thousand eighteen calendar year, two thousand nineteen. You need to start setting the table because you can't catch up. You'll never so that's where that's where the the planning and I won't call it betting, but the planning and sort of the risk assessment comes in. Yeah yeah. So the the, the four, we do did we need four hundred people to hit this year? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But, you need but it's all about setting the table for 18. Yeah, you'll need them for 18 and, mm -hmm. and plus more. And, and so your, you know, your, your, your process of hiring and, and uh, how much has it changed going from 400 to 1,000 or 400 to 800? I mean, has, it, has the process changed to bring people in? The, it's become the velocity of hiring has been, made, has been possible through having a greater diversity in the roles we're hiring for. So initially, when we hired our first salesperson, we had an inside sales rep who sold to existing customers to expand their usage of Smartsheet. And then we had uh, a role that focused on new business, sort of e-commerce support. People would use the product trial, getting them on board, not existing customer. Then we looked at senior new business reps, strategic reps to target the top 450. So that aperture for role grew tremendously. Sure. Then we had customer success people, seniors, mid-market, customer success associates right out of school. So we have this real diversity now that, that we can hire. And as a father of two daughters, um, one of the things that I try and really be an advocate for in the tech space is this notion of it's not all about math and science. So well over half of our employees have nothing to do with development. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. They serve, they consult, and some of these are, they design. Some of these are like really well-paying positions. Yeah. So I like to... Um, I think it's important to note. It's a big part of sort of my sort of women in tech piece. Yeah. It's um, really trying to trying to get the educate the word out that tech companies are hiring across a very diverse group of a uh, set of roles. Yeah, and it's not just engineers. No, it yeah. isn't. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, question I ask almost every guest ever I've ever interviewed: How did you earn your first dollar that wasn't from a relative? Mm, that's an easy one. What do you think? Uh, yard work. Uh, it was oh, a paper route. Yes. Oh, paper route. And uh, I'll tell this story. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to name names. But I'll tell this story. I'll tell this story. What city? What city was you? Bellevue, Washington. We moved here in 1976. Okay. We moved over from Germany, and uh, my brother and I had a paper route. Got it. And uh, we had our paper route cart that we dragged behind our bike. Sure. And back in the day, we had to go door to door to collect our monthly. Yeah, I had the same job. And there was one house that never freaking paid us on time. It was like, do you do I really have to come back here three times to get, to get my, my four dollars? Six dollars. <laughs> it's probably like four and a quarter. Yeah. So years later, years later, like thirty years later, I'm at this dinner party in Seattle, and I meet this really nice this is person. Great. 
and the person says their last name, and I go, Oh, did you live at one blah, 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 blah? And she goes, yes. <laughs> I go, interesting, interesting, noted, noted. <laughs> That was, my, that, was my, that was my first dollar. That is awesome. So you met the 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 the, the, the family the, that never paid. Yeah. For just it, took it, a long time to pay. And this person I was speaking with had nothing to do with that situation sure. back in seventy whatever it was eight. Yeah. Um, but I think that was a really good job because um, it you know we had to earn it. Getting up early not easy. Yeah. I, th I think I look back at the job. This one summer I packed panels on a foundation crew. Have you ever done that before? Hard job. Yeah. That's You're packing four by eight panels. Not, not glamorous, yeah. but you get an appreciation for sort of the gritty, yeah. the gritty work. Yeah, I bought tape for summer. There you go. I haven't done that before. That's a hard one. Um, and so, so uh, you know, let's take a step back and say, you know, early days. Go back to the early days of you know, smart sheet. Um, if you were going to do it over again, and you're starting with basically the same team, mm -hmm. what were the things that you would say, here's, let's do this differently. Let's do this differently. What were the thing? what would be one or maybe two things at the most that you would want to maybe try differently because you know, whatever reason doesn't really matter. What, what things would those be? Like how early do you want me to go? I'm like about, early, early? I'm talking about five, eight, ten people in the house. Yeah, I would not have hired, I would not have invested Anything in sales, we had we actually had some capacity in sales developed too early. Yeah. And you that, sell. As a CEO, you yeah, sell. And, and that was just it wasn't it wasn't productive. Yeah, it wasn't productive. Yeah. So that's one thing I would have I would have saved a, a few bucks to not do that until we had a better sense for market fit. And and the history of Smartsheet was we actually had a tiny bit of sales capacity early. And then we went without any sales capacity for six years, <laughs> and and we and we 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 were totally self-directed online trial and buy, yeah. built a pretty interesting business with zero salespeople, and we didn't hire our sales capacity until late 2012. So just strictly direct market. I mean, strictly online direct. trial and buy. Wow. Yeah. So it's good marketers. Uh, I think it was a good product. Yeah. Good Bad product. marketers, good product. Uh, not much marketing. Really? Not much marketing, no. Wow. Good for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you were if you were giving advice to first time, second time entrepreneurs, um, what two two things would you tell them to do first? I would say don't team up and then say, once we team up, let's come up with the idea. It's it's interesting how often they hear that. So you're saying don't do that. Don't do not do that. Yeah. Have get your idea. This thing of like we're going to start the company, we're going to name the company, we're going to get our domain, and then we're going to figure out what we're going to do. Wrong sequence. Okay, wait, wait, wait. But it's interesting how often I hear that, Mike. Yeah. A lot of people say, "I'm finally ready in my career where I can start something, set the table. Now what?" <laughs> it's like you need the idea first. <laughs> you need the idea yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good <laughs> the. Um, Oh, was that maybe Aaron uh, last was here last month? We talked about that. That the um, build before you build before you sell, yeah. like like or excuse me, sell before you build. Like when you're talking to customers, before you build that feature, sell it as if it already exists, yeah. so you don't build the wrong flipping thing, yeah. right? So that's the same style as you know, get it, make sure it's real before you start building it. I think another thing, Mike, is is when you when you think when we look at the the usage within the product. There is a certain part of the product or a certain set of capabilities in the product which are heavily used, and then there's that long tail. And the long tail can be very expensive to develop and get have, have marginal impact on winning a customer, retaining a customer, or growing a customer. Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, you know, figuring out what that kernel is and testing for it and uh, building, listening for feedback, you want that you want that user to have a lot of heat behind that next ask as opposed to oh man that's really nice thanks for building that extra thing that you never use it and it's super expensive to to maintain and to carry forward so that's another part where maybe zero uh, compressed scope a little bit we built some really cool stuff early like really cool super complex that no one Whatever used you yeah, absolutely that happens all the time it does yeah yeah that's the thing that I, I think that that to me is the 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 early stage like 
faux pas that, that is just so easy to, because engineers love to build cool stuff, but they forget to talk to the customers and say, do we actually want that cool stuff? <laughs> like, build like three things at work. Don't worry about the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and mm -hmm. tenth thing. Those kids need to come down the road. So I think the other the other piece is uh, when you when you're building that early team, uh, don't get don't fall for the oh that person was so awesome there. Oh, at, at X. So awesome! It is amazing title. He or she was the blah 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 of the blah blah blah. Like, they must be awesome. Or they had a great team who did all that awesome stuff for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't know. So that's, yeah, I've, I've seen that a few yeah. times as well. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've fallen for that a few times as well, too. It's not, sure. it's not just I've seen it. I've actually it seen it. <laughs> like real time. Up close and personal. <laughs> <laughs> and and where, where is the, uh, um, like, the landmines, I call them landmines in those early stages, you know, from 5 to you know, 15, 20 employees. Where do you think some landmines that you discovered and you would warn other people starting companies? Like, give me a couple landmines. Like, here's, here's some things to watch for. Like we just talked about in the product. Like, what are some things that you've learned over the you know, early stages? Yeah. So I think the, um, the landmines, you, you'll often hear people talk about the at the 30 mark or at the 50 mark or the 100 mark or the 200 mark or the 500 mark. I think there are some real organizational um, uh, employee count thresholds they have to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. And the cost of reacting to those is maybe multiple times the cost if you were to do a little bit of pre-planning, preventative maintenance. Um, so for us, it was, for us, the 200 mark was a big one. Yeah. Um, because you were, didn't plan that well enough before, or just because it was a big one? Uh, it was a big one. We were, I think the, that, the comment I had about recruiting earlier, uh. right? We're, we, we, we reacted to not having recruiting capacity. Sure. Um, that was one which cost us probably a couple quarters. Pretty expensive lessons to learn. Yeah. Um, I think the, I think about the business more of it's a collection of thousands of right decisions than I do avoid the landmines. Yeah. Um, I think it's when someone says, who's that one person who really influenced me? It wasn't one person. And what was that one, who's that one customer? It wasn't that one customer. <laughs> it is get up, rinse, and repeat every single day. We're an 11-year-old company. The I told the company this last summer at an all-hands meeting, I said it took us 10 years to get our first 50 million, 17 months to get our next 50, 50 million. Okay, and that's not because of one decision. That's like, yeah, like that's hundreds. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of decisions. So if you get up and you observe and you process, you react, you decide, you do the next. It is just a collection of those. I think if you, if you, if you ever say, "Hey, man, that was that was the landmine. We avoided it, and we're now we're winning," and it's like buckle up because you have a whole set of decisions coming tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, they're they're not going to stop just because. No, you it's a it's continuous, avoid continuous, that, continuous. Avoid that landmine. And, and, you know, the the positive, you know, the kind of glass half full mentality mm -hmm. of the, especially the early days, um, where, where where are the things that you can, you know, look your partner in, your, in their eye and say, here are the three things that we were really good at. And again, these are lots of people. It's not one person. But what are those things that you guys are just really good at? Give me two things you guys are just really good at. We're really good at not drinking our own Kool-Aid. Like, really good at that. Yeah. So we had a customer conference this September, 1,100 customers in the building. It was a flippin' love fest. Sure. And the next morning, it's like, buckle up. Yeah. Buckle up. Because I had a lot of heat the next morning. And it wasn't because, oh, yeah, everyone said we were so awesome. It was like, here are the 13 things I heard from these clients that we need to do a lot better, yeah. like, now. Yeah. And, that's, and that doesn't mean I don't celebrate the, the great events, but it's like, I, back to that competitive thing, right? It's like, if there are, we have 73,000 customers globally. And at any moment, I can pull up my phone and say, here's how we're not serving someone as well as oh, we can. Sure. Yeah, it's always going to be the case. So I think the Kool-Aid, the not drinking your own Kool-Aid is one I take a lot of pride in. I think the, the other one is um, we had a set of people who just, um, like you often say, you often hear, yeah, that person was really, you know, that person really persevered. Like I was at a VC meeting where <laughs> one person actually said, I don't think your product will ever generate a single dollar of revenue. <laughs> 
I'm like, that's a, first of all, it's a hurtful comment. Um, <laughs> first of all, I think that should have been a thought bubble, not actually, <laughs> not actually, not actually out loud. Uh, but sort of, so right on the, I, I have a, I still have a huge chip, chip in my shoulder. Yeah, a huge chip. Yeah. A huge chip. That, you, you would never forget that. No. You'll never forget that guy. And uh, ever. I love seeing him. <laughs> I see him once, I've probably seen him a couple times a year. You should see him in the emails. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's uh, it, but the the point of so not drinking your own Kool Aid and then a team of people who had um, a very high tolerance for not being shut down by others. Yeah, yeah, just pushing through. Mm -hmm. And the tough, I think, the really tough thing as an entrepreneur is. Um, we didn't have, like, it wasn't de-risked completely. Like, we felt very, very confident that we were going to be able to make it through. But it wasn't, like, 100%. Yeah. And I think it's it's very tough sometimes. At some point, you need to call the ball and say, you know what, this is actually not working. Like, you have to that yeah. fail. It, like, it took us five, five years before we actually knew we could really drop the hammer on it. And I think in that fifth year, that was actually a moment, had we not seen the evidence on that rebuilt product hit, we would have had to say, you know what, it's been a great ride. And that was five years, like in our prime years, yeah. like super expensive uh, window. But fortunately, we didn't have to, fortunately, we didn't have to, yeah, to do it. Didn't have to do that. Uh, Those are the two. Questions, guys. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, so in that, in that um, you know, again, you know, that, those early days, where where are the th where are the things that um, you leaned on? Uh, do you have, uh, I'm assuming you have people that you I call them your inner circle that you work with, uh, you know, mentors, friends, maybe they're investors. Uh, it depends on how you, re you relate to some of these people, but like that sounding board, I call it, call it a sounding board. How many times in the past five years has that sounding board been super critical? For you, as probably, a, as a probably twice. Twice. Yeah. So okay, so two times in five years, you kind of had to go back to the, the sounding board and say, "We got some tough decisions here. I'm not quite sure how to handle it." Right. And what was the uh, was that a humbling process for you? Totally. Totally. I mean, it's, and that's the one thing where, uh, if you. Like I'm, I'm a pretty. I would say my wife would also say that I'm a pretty defensive person. Like I don't like to be wrong, and, and part of it's you don't want to be embarrassed. And you, I mean, there are a bunch, there's a bunch of aspects sure. to to uh, react to. Totally, know. but I also um, have no shame in learning from someone else. Like zero, and that doesn't mean you just you know oh, you're not looking. <laughs> But you're deeply, you're actually genuinely interested in what someone else has learned. Sure. Because I view that as if you've paid a tax, Mike, and you're willing, you're willing to share a little bit of that knowledge with me, I think I'm a smart enough guy where I can sort of distill, like, okay, that's that's a high value thing, or that really was meaningful to him or not. Yeah. Um, I don't have any issue in learning from others. None. Yeah. And that's, that's I think, I think some people actually have a challenge with that. They don't want to expose themselves on that dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think the... Uh, the tough things, uh, I would say, the, the the really sort of those moments over the years are when you have that, you need to make that big call to either make a roster change mm -hmm. where it may be um, very difficult because you really care for the individual. And that's one where um, I think one of the things I really credit my board for is they uh, strongly encouraged me two years ago to, um, to really look at my senior leadership team. Yeah. And they say, Mark, you know, you have you have some really great people at the company, but you realize how big a difference it is between being a sixty million dollar modest growth company. And what you need, and and the, it's not always it's not just the here are the skills they have, but also people who aren't intimidated by scale. Yeah. Right, and those are the people who um, who I've melded now with an amazing team that's been with us for a long time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. no, that's that's important to understand because that. You know the ability to go from you know eighty million to hundred million. It's not a like not all have not everyone has that skill. Eighty to right. eighty to excuse me eight hundred eighty to two hundred for eighty to three hundred eight or mm -hmm. four hundred right when you're mm -hmm. making those big steps. Mm -hmm. Not skill in some people don't have the experience. They've never done it. Not even remotely close to it. Mm -hmm. right? um, I think the other the other piece, Mike, that I um, so I had a I had a meeting the other night with. Uh, uh, a gentleman who was one of the early members at um, at Target, oh. and my, he's 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 a neighbor, and he's probably I think he's probably 
early 70s. Wow. So, so he, he's now not only with Target, but used to be with Target. Correct. Okay. Amazing, amazing guy. And one of the things that um, I've observed is that um, people, like really great people, are actually very generous with their time. And so very often people just don't ask. They don't ask. So um, that was a person I reached out to, and we were going through a planning process, and he enrolled me in the playbook that Target ran when they were 40 people. Really? I mean, like, ama amazing story. And that'll stay with me for the rest of my career. Okay. And I, I took a, like, a little bit of learning there and applied that. But I was super grateful to him. And it's like, when you actually genuinely um, convey thanks to someone, they will reinvest. Sure. They will continue to invest. Um, but I think it's, it, people just don't ask enough. Yeah. Whenever I give a talk at, you know, in a college setting, I always say, hey, if anybody wants to connect with me after, like maybe 2%. Yeah, that's fair. Back to your question. If you hit me on LinkedIn, have a point. People, like, people just, it doesn't actually take that much energy to come up with a thoughtful <laughs> question, a single question. <laughs> it's just one. It's the last, it's one. And who knows, maybe it leads to something, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think one of the things that uh, I was, I talked, I was spoke at Seattle U this week. I got my MBA there, so I spoke at one of the classes. And, uh, you know, they're, they're high school seniors. I mean, college seniors. And um, I, I see one of the things that, that I've always found interesting from entrepreneurs, for especially young entrepreneurs, is it's so easy today in today's world, and that wasn't 20 years ago when I was starting to, to find, to meet you. Like, they can, I mean, they can connect with you, like, via LinkedIn. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Like, you just have that ability, and, and all of us can do that. It's just, you just got to take the initiative to do it and have some thought behind it, and you'd be amazed at who will respond back to you with just a, sure, let's talk for five minutes on the phone. Sometimes that will change your whole trajectory of your company, uh, especially in your early, early, early days. Um, are you, do you mentor other, others? others? Are you? I, I converse with a lot of people. I, I, the word mentor, actually, I'm not a, not a fan. I'm not a fan. Yeah. I just, it, I, you help others. Yeah. I mean, talk to each other. Be genuine in your interactions. Share what you know. It's, um, yeah, I think the, the mentor, the mentor word, it, it just carries a little weight to it. And I think it's, uh, Sometimes people are actually intimidated by that word. Yeah. So like, keep it simple. Yeah, keep it super simple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you have a question? Did I see a hand? No, I thought I saw a hand. Almost. Oh, go ahead. What was the tipping point in the sense that you were going along in five years, and then you know, 2013, it sounds like when you started to take off in a significant way. Mm -hmm. what, what changed? It, it, maybe a distraction, or what, 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 your, what was your perception of change yeah. that made a, a big difference? The, um, the company went from being majority focused on product to being equal focused on distribution. And so you can spend, back to that, we really love to talk about product, we're going to build, uh, taking a lot of that energy and saying, where do we want to make the, the product available and known to people? And that can be as simple as a highly instrumented um, pay-per-click campaign, which isn't like just, hey, let's spend some money, but like, let's instrument it. Like, let's see who it serves up, how they click in, how they use it, do they buy, uh, focusing on partnerships that generate it. And if very often you'll see someone who high centers on product and then like, Oh yeah, let's also distribute a little bit. And I was like, really? Like, are you spending thirty to forty percent of your time on that? So that was a tipping point for us, where we we felt like the product was at a point where we could make that have that change in focus, and then we saw evidence of certain actions working, and then having the guts to throttle up. And the guts would be like early days spending the equivalent of maybe four thousand dollars on pay per click, and spending. A lot more than that now, mm -hmm. but it's because the evidence showed and the confidence that having was a way to go. Yeah, yeah, and and that tipping point, it's um. I was explaining to someone the other day a little bit about our business, and it's not this like one thing okay. that causes the revenue. It's a it's a layer cake. We have new business unassisted, new business assisted, expansion SMB, expansion commercial, expansion yeah, enterprise. Yeah. We have licensed product. We have modules. We have so every one of those things. So it's resilient in the sense that. You take one of those layers out, cake still tastes really good. Really good. Tastes better with all of them, yeah. but it's still really good. And um, I think when you, that tipping point can actually sneak up on you a little bit. And for us, it was actually not so much us saying, hey, we hit the tipping point, but more an outside investor going, 
Whoa. Do you guys have any idea what the hell you have going here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's funny because sometimes you're so inwardly focused, you know, we don't spend our time like data pointing yeah, against, yeah. yeah. But that, that's, and it's, I would encourage everyone to, um, to find a person or two to actually help you do that comparison because you may be actually much further along than you thought. Thank you. Uh, interesting. That's very interesting. And, and where, where is the, uh, go ahead. Um, I would like to know um, about your first investor story in particular. How was it in Seattle? And uh, would you do that again here uh, if you were to do this all over? I would. I think we have, uh, uh, I'm very uh, biased in the sense that the investor we worked with here, um, the first organizational institutional investor was Madrona Venture Group. And, um, and who's your person there? Uh, Matt McElwain. Sure. And they've been a, they've been a very... Um, committed partner and and when when things don't go well that's typically when you see how committed somebody is mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't mean that they supported us blindly they wanted to hear the good plan they wanted to understand the mechanics of, of how we were going to improve our situation uh, but they were I wouldn't say unwavering in their support but they were very supportive very supportive uh, so the first investor story was actually not um, was actually not someone like Madrona, it was Angels. It was, right. uh, and we, we had the good fortune of uh, having a core investor group, yeah. which were the, was the founding group, who actually had some capital to get it started. Right? But we raised probably a million and a half of Angel before, friends and family, before we went to Madrona. Um, and that Series A, is, it's kind of interesting, right? Because you don't have a lot to show for yet. We had, we had evidence that people were interested in what we were talking about, though. So even though we weren't generating revenue, we had thousands of people coming in and trialing. They weren't buying anything yet, <laughs> but they were trialing. And that's, that message, that story was framed in a certain way to a sufficient degree where they, where they decided to invest. Do you think that they um, bet on your, uh, the entrepreneur's past experiences, um, at least to a certain degree, or is it purely the product? I think it's the idea and the people. Again, the past experiences can be helpful. But it's not, a, it's not like a trump card to improve your odds on your next idea. Um, so I think it's, it carries some weight. But I would say the, the, the quality of the people and their commitment to it. And again, the, the, what the VCs are very good at, what Madrona is very good at, is understanding the circumstances. So the circumstances might be personal circumstances, market conditions. I mean, good investors really understand that, that, yeah. that uh, those various dimensions. Yeah. Uh, Matt? Yeah, Mark, as a... Um firm that uses Smartsheet, again, daily, um, I got to imagine, like, in the early days, you got a lot of this feedback of, can't I just do that next time? And, I mean, how did you differentiate enough early on? And I hope that's, like, not offensive, but no, I got to imagine you probably heard that more than once yeah. as you were building and iterating. Yeah, well, so we do um, this trailing well, I, don't, I can't, this will be recorded. So we do, we, we have a lot of trials going at any given time. We have well over 100,000 trials going on right now on our product. 100,000? So, 100,000? Well over 100,000. Like, well over 100,000. Wow! So, we, and See, 100, you know, 190 countries. So, you know so part of what makes that conversation easier is that you're already here. Like, w w no, you're at my door. <laughs> so you tell me why you're trialing. So there's something that sparked for you. Whether it's the fact that the data was a little bit structured, the fact that we have some approval flows. Yeah, and I mean, I love, how wasn't this great meeting in Seattle once where we gave, I thought, a really good presentation, and the CIO said, uh, you know I could do all of that in, uh, on my XYZ platform. I said, and I wasn't a smart ass, I said, why haven't you done it? And it was like, it's not a matter of can you do it, it's like, will you do it? Yeah. And you won't do it because you don't have the people, you don't have the time, you don't have the... So, so part of it is that speed to impact. So our big deal is I actually give a lot of credit. Analysts don't give a lot of credit to non-devs and non-citizen developers. Like the average worker, knowledge worker, does not know how to code, has an allergic reaction to complexity, but they actually have a sense of what they need to do. So if you can enable that population in the market to get shit done, there's huge loyalty developed and a lot of value generated. 
So, so many software companies focus on the what, and I focus as much on the, the how and the by whom. Like, my best story from the customer conference wasn't, uh, while I love the stories about Cisco and Aramark and Sodexo and North Face, highly capable teams doing amazing stuff, my favorite was the gal from Detroit Parks and Rec who stood up at our customer conference and asked, actually gave me critical feedback on how we can improve our countering X, Y, Z. And I loved it. I loved it because she was so not dev and she was from a lightly funded group who was trying to improve. Like that made my freaking conference. Yeah. Because yeah, it was all, yeah. you knew what she was saying wasn't like, there was yeah. no made up or I'm doing it for my boss. It's like, I need this. So what helps though, what, what helps today, which was more difficult in the early days, was now there are a bunch of things which we do that you actually can't do in Excel and you can't do in Sheets. So it's kind of like, well, yeah. you can hire a dev to maybe build that for you, but most people won't do that. Um, so that's been a big help. Rich. So kind of on that point, you brought Fort Delvene in to the conference. Mm -hmm. How long is that? I mean, unique choice of individuals, right? Because some would say direct competitor. Huge partner. Yeah. So think about every one of our customers, everyone runs either Google or Microsoft. So you're using it somewhere. So you better have a damn good story on how you tie into the Microsoft ecosystem and a damn good story on how you plug into the Google ecosystem. So I would say our stuff um, better enables the usage of O365 in mail, in MS Teams, which we're a daily user of. Um, it provides structure to your office docs so that they're not sitting in OneDrive somewhere, but you can actually show, associate them in the context of your work, whether it's an event or it's a client follow-up list. Um, so if you tell that story well, then Microsoft is super supportive because if you can help drive the adoption of their leading platform, big win. Big win. And with a big company like that, or with a Google, or with an Amazon, uh, maybe not Amazon so much, but with Google and Microsoft, there's going to be someone somewhere in their ecosystem with whom you're not aligned. Like who, who's like, oh my gosh, they're a direct competitor. And then they're like, many other people for whom you're an enabler. Um, so you can't, be, you can't be dissuaded by that one person who says, enemy. No, because there are so many others who are like, awesome partner. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, the first one, um, we all know you have amazing culture and one of the best companies to work for. And you mentioned the values as a I'm guessing big part of it. And what uh, point in your journey did you just start thinking about the values for your company and the culture? I would credit our head of people ops for actually pushing us to write them down. Like I think we've, we've always had them. We've always worked a certain way. But it's that when, you, when we hit that couple hundred person mark and we wanted to actually say, okay, that's Spokane to us. Like, what are we actually testing for in the drive? Yeah. Uh, it was actually really worth it to, to write them down. And the words that we choose to describe the values, those are also hard to do, right? So you don't just knock those out in 30 seconds. Uh, it's an iterative process. We added one this year. Um, and, and what I focus more of my energy on, like I let, I let her really take the lead on that. And then I, I very much feel responsible for the operationalizing of it, right? The method, the how do we live them? Um, but it, it, documenting them is critical, critical. Oh, more questions, I may ask. Uh, so one of the interesting things you mentioned was um, the notion of react, so reacting to a situation. Yes. Um, can you tell more about why do you think it's happening, and how do you, what do you do to kind of improve? How do you, how do you uh, uh, have a not reactive culture? Is that what you're saying? Well, one of the weaknesses I think you mentioned was reacting to a situation, or being like, reacting to uh, a problem fast. Yeah, so I think the um, I think people who have a tendency to react uh, sometimes don't distinguish between things that matter and don't matter. Okay, so um, you stubbed your toe walking in. Why is the threshold so high? I'm going to react and I'm going to give Nick a whole bunch of feedback on how his entry is all screwed. Like, yeah. Dude, it's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Maybe you should lift your foot up a little higher, right? Yeah. So I think I think really having that having a really clear sense of what matters and what doesn't. Everything in life matters to a degree. Any decision you make is going to 
be, be embraced by one person and hated by another. They like welcome to life. Yes. But it's a matter of assessing, like, okay, to what degree? Are most people happy? What's the biggest return? How many customers does it help? And then being able to very quickly assess that. And, and then if you're like, hit, 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 huge customer impact, huge dollar impact, huge employee impact, go now. Right? So it's almost that the filter on, on making that assessment. So I still like reacting. But it's that it's the, the sort of the self coaching and constant understanding of pushing yourself to apply that filter before before you move. It can also be giving feedback to somebody, right? It's like you typically can give feedback to someone on something they say, but yeah. you know, sometimes it's just not worth it. Yeah, it's not worth it. It's, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Go ahead. Last, last question, by the way. Uh, Mark, you recently just raised like fifty million this year, coming off your largest raise. Can you talk a little bit about how that raise was different than the previous three or four? You know, what is the story at that point? And then also, looking ahead to 2018, 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. what are you now telling your employees in terms of where the company's going? Yeah, the, the, raising, the raising piece is a really, uh, and this is where raising is just such a wicked beast, because I, I talked to a good friend who led the last round, and I said, you know, Ryan, if I could have just taken a little bit of that goodness from this round, like, Injected it nine years ago. It's so much easier. Like, so, but <laughs> exactly. that's just not the way it works, right? So, exactly. success breeds success. Our unit metrics, our growth retention curves, like it's all it's all really strong. So it was from start to finish. It was probably a six week process, like part time. And it's not bad. It was great. <laughs> it was great. But when you look at the time, the number, of, the amount of energy we, we put in that first round. So what's changed, what we have learned, is if you have something that you believe um, for which there's demand, make it introduce multiple parties to the process. Essential. That's a lesson I underappreciated early that I fully appreciate now. And some of the toughest calls I had to make were to the five, the five companies who gave us term sheets who didn't get that $52 million deal. That was tough. Because they're all super, super good, good people. people. Uh, they yeah. busted their behinds. They were authentic in their interactions. Those were terrible calls to make. Yeah. Like career, like yeah. one of the low five <laughs> five points. Yeah, yeah. On vacation with my family, I'm like, honey, I got to go. I got to take the morning. Like five really bad calls. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was the big difference, though, in that raise. And and as I mentioned, I mentioned someone the other day uh, where I said the the importance of raising and this whole notion of dilution. Uh, the, one of the pieces of advice I would give uh, folks starting up is don't underestimate the value of an external party. And as you're just fixated on retaining ownership, you know, you have to really ask yourself, would you rather own 3% of something that is a billion, 2 billion, 3 billion? Or would you rather own 57% of something that's worth Pick your number, right? Five million. Five million. One million. Yeah. Um, and it's tough to give up. It's tough to give up ownership. But that goes for uh, allocating ownership to investors. It goes for allocating ownership to fellow employees. Um, you know, so one of my one of my career highlights at Smartsheet will be the first QA person we hired, who um, joined us when we were 13 or 14 people. She's an incredible woman, uh, for whom it's been a life changing outcome. Yeah. Just and over the, over the term. so in addition to like the economics and the the game theory like hey if we no it's like because of her like you get up in the morning you're like I'm going to go to work for her. and that's a really powerful it's a super it's much more than life actually doesn't change that much with these events like someone might say oh my gosh you you raised this you get up the next morning it's the sa it's the exact <laughs> same business yeah. exact same business nothing has changed it's really it's really strange that's one thing i Totally misread early in my career. You thought it would be different. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Totally. Million dollars in my bank. I feel different. No, I mean, no, you, you, no. It's not. It's not. A, it's it's both an organizational statement as 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 much like we haven't. We're a private company. We haven't had like yeah. the big. It's um. But that's one thing which like keep life just keep it real because yeah. it's just. <laughs> Keep it real. Keep that's it real. Probably, that's, that's probably the best piece of advice there. Let's keep it real. Don't, I like the one where don't drink your own Kool-Aid, right? That's, yeah. That's a tough it's a biggie. one. That's a hard one. Because um, yeah, that, that definitely can happen very easily. Um, well, so we're done. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, sir. Good to yeah. see you. Thank you. Uh,
So thank you all for being here. Thank you for 2017. 2000